Hello, everybody. I am ple pleased to be here. And of course, you know my, uh, my partner in, in all this, which is Tony. Still Tony. <laughs> still <laughs> Tony. Hasn't changed. That hasn't changed. <laughs> and we are both very pleased because we have a very special guest who happens to be in chapter 14 of my book. It has nothing to do with, with uh, age. I just had to make. I just had to make. Just had to make sure of that. Um, but let me just start out um, reading just a little part of a little little part of this. When this was this book was written uh, about a year ago. And at the time, I wrote in the first paragraph, Jack Scholl, born October 30, 1925. So he's got a birthday coming up, and this will make him 88. And you can never tell by just looking at this young man. Is one of rowing's most respected and revered legends. And you're really going to hear a lot today. And in his mid-80s, Jack still continues to compete in rowing. Jack has been competing for 64 years in this sport at all age levels. So we're going to talk about rowing, but before, but before we talk about rowing, I have a quote that I'd like Jack to respond to. Jack, I'm going to read you this quote by Anatole France, and if you'll tell me how it relates to you and your life. Okay. Okay. To accomplish great things, we must not only act, but also dream. Not only plan, but also believe. I agree with it 100%, Frank. In fact, I'm more of a dreamer, perhaps, than, than a planner, but uh, I arrive at the destination anyway. So. Well, tell us I, a little bit more about how it relates to you. To your, well, it relates to, your to me in a way that I started to, I'm a Philadelphian, and there's a river called the Schuylkill that flows through Philadelphia. In fact, President Washington was very familiar with the Schuylkill River, of course. And along the shore of the Schuylkill River in Philadelphia, there are 10 rowing clubs. So I've been a member of one of those rowing clubs for 65 years. Okay, I'm so going to stop you at the moment. Now, not only is Jack a member of a rowing club, his wife Joan is also a member of a rowing club. And this is for you, Tony, <laughs> okay. because Joan lived near the Kellys. John B. Yes, Kelly. Yes, you've told Some me of, the story. Well, no, <laughs> you, no you, only part of the story. So John, John B. Kelly, some of you may know, some of you may not. Jack knows firsthand, Joan knows firsthand, and some of you may have heard of, of the Kelly's daughter, one of the daughters, which is roughly, who is roughly Jack's age. So Joan, of course, knows her very well, and so does Jack <laughs> very well. Yep. And the daughter's name is Grace Kelly, the actress who married the prince. Which prince? Rainier. I just want to know if you knew. All right, Jack. So <laughs> go ahead about the rowing clubs because there's a story here. Yeah. <clears throat> Along the banks of the bank of the Schuylkill River in Philadelphia, there are 10 rowing clubs. And they all date back to 1859, 1860, 1870, and so forth. They're That's before Tony's time. Before Tony's time. Unfortunately, not yours. <laughs> <laughs> They're Victorian and in, in architecturally, got me. they are Victorian structures, very colorfully painted. And the city of Philadelphia, uh, I guess it was about 15 or 20 years ago, a decorated boathouse row with tiny light bulbs along the eaves, the doorways, and the windows of every single one of those boathouses. So if you're driving up the West River Drive across the river from those boathouses, you might see the, the reflection of those boathouses mirrored in the Schuylkill River. It's absolutely beautiful. And the Philadelphia Electric Company can change 
the color. There's several hundred thousand bulbs there of a single bulb. So when the Eagles, the Philadelphia Eagles, win a football game, all of those lights are green. <laughs> after the game is over. And of course, on the 4th of July, the top part of the boathouse row is red lights, the middle are white, and the bottom are blue, red, white, and blue. It's a magnificent sight wow. to behold, it really is. Now we're gonna talk more about rowing, but I wanna deviate from that. Be sure. Because you mentioned President George Washington. Right. And I know there's a connection to George Washington and your family and to you, but also not only that, I want you to go back and talk about how your great, great eight generations eighth, ago yeah. got to this country. Well, my eighth great grandfather is a, name, a man by the name of Gerhardt, and uh, he lived in a little village in Germany William Penn personally went to Germany to recruit farmers to come and populate Pennsylvania. So he, he got the attention of my eighth great grandfather, Peter Schumacher, who took him, took William Penn up on that offer, came to Philadelphia in 1685 and uh, settled right there in, in what, uh, what is now called Germantown, part of Philadelphia. And uh, William Penn on one Sunday morning preached a sermon in my grandfather's house in Germantown, <laughs> in Philadelphia. So he was a dyed-in-the-wool uh, patriot, really, and uh, I'm very proud of him. But let's go also and back to the, t well, let, we'll move on from s the 1600s to now we'll go into the 1700s yeah. and the Revolutionary War. Okay. Uh, most of my ancestors named Scholl. Well, was, how did Shoemaker to Scholl? How did that go from Shoemaker to Scholl? A different line of the, of the family. It was on, uh, on my mother's side. Okay. Is your mother a Shoemaker? She's an Overholzer, but related to <laughs> Shoemaker. Okay. <laughs> so it comes your, down through one of these. So things. it's your mom on your mom's side. My mom's side. Okay. Yes. Okay. And. Uh, on my father's side, uh, the Scholls came from uh, from Germany, and their name was spelled S C H O L L. You see why I make that mistake? <laughs> <And> <laughs> <He's always laughs> when they arrived at the port of Philadelphia in September of 1728, uh, the British port of entry uh, official looked at the manifest of passengers saw my grandfather's name, S-C-H-O-L-L. -L. For some reason, he spelled it S-H-O-L-L. -L. <laughs> and apparently, my, I'm guessing now, that we think my grandfather was afraid to change it back because it was done by the British, and now it's <laughs> official, right? right? So his name became S-H-O-L-L, -L, and his brother came over some months later, like six months later, and they didn't cross out the C in his name. Oh. And... Both brothers are buried now outside of Philadelphia near a, a village called Lansdowne. And uh, one has S-C-H-O-L-L -L <laughs> on his tombstone, the other S-H-O-L-L, -L, and they're bro brothers. That would certainly challenge a novice genealogy looking at yeah, would. Oh, yeah, looking it would. For the ancestors, yeah. But they're brothers. Huh. <laughs> okay, move to, move to the... Revolutionary War and the Underground Railroad? Yeah, no, in a, in a Revolutionary War, I had uh, six multiple great-grandfathers who served <laughs> in the Pennsylvania militia. At the moment, I can only prove three of them. I have, haven't had the time to do the, the research on the other three, but it's a fact. How come you haven't had the time? Uh, I'm busy with, uh, with other things like the Sons of the Revolution. Well, we'll get into that. We'll get into that too. For so, uh, eventually, I'll probably get around to it, Frank. But right now, I have three who I'm sure of that served in the Pennsylvania militia during the War of the Revolution. And of course, that was an act of treason in those days, and uh, if caught, you you would be hung by the British Army. But but a requisite for being a member of the Sons of the Revolution. This is their emblem. One right. has to have an, a 
an ancestor who committed an act of treason. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, against wow. the British army. Wow. Wow. Not just fight in the Revolution. Not just fight, but treason. Well, that would be an act of treason if he okay. fought, <laughs> fought in the, uh, got it. Okay. the state militia. Yeah, <laughs> that's an act of I treason. I don't have that. Well, Remember the <laughs> Committee of Safety, which was another wa way to commit an act of treason. I have a, a great uncle who was a, m a member of the, uh, the group who kept their eye on the British. They reported to a uh, Continental Army the movements of the British Army, and that was an act of treason also. So her grandfather who did that, his name was Zartman, Z-A-R-T-M-A-N. <laughs> and it's an old Pennsylvania name da dating way back before the Revolution. Hmm. There's a big monument in, uh, in a village near Lancaster, big stone that has the Zartman name on it. They were real, real patriots. With mm -hmm. which I'm very proud, of course. So it's an interesting thing to do, genealogical research. And uh, when one does it, being in, in, in uh, let's say, the, uh, the library in Philadelphia, uh, at 9 o'clock it's closing time, 10 minutes to 9, they ring a buzzer. You have to leave just when you're on the trail to something really <laughs> good in your genealogical tree. <coughs> Why do you come back the next day? That would be the Pennsylvania Historical Society, an excellent place to do uh, genealogical research. But tell us about the Underground Railroad. Oh, yes. Uh, my fourth great grandmother, whose name was Gerhard, G E R H A R T, owned a hotel and tavern near Lansdale, Pennsylvania, on the old Pennsylvania uh, Highway to Bethlehem, and uh, she was very friendly to, uh, in fact, she hid the Liberty Bell in her barn when they're taking it from Philadelphia to... Tony knows about that. To Allentown. That story. He knew about that and story. And the Liberty Bell was in a wagon, of course, drawn by multiple horses, and they covered it with manure. <laughs> so <laughs> no the British would wouldn't recognize yeah. it if they, that's true, if they, if uh -huh. they stopped it. So when they got to this little village, uh, my grandmother permitted them to bring the horse and wagon into the, with the Liberty Bell in, into her barn for the night. Big barn. But it had to be a big barn. It was a, big, a huge barn, right. Huge barn, yeah. And uh, in fact, there's a, there's a sign painted on the side of the barn today that says Liberty Bell House with a picture of the Liberty Bell on it. Okay. Oh. Yeah, and so the officer stayed at the in the tavern that night, and the troops slept in the field, and the bell, of course, as I said, was in the barn. And then they moved on. That would have been a serious act of treason if caught by the British. But she was a feisty old lady, old gal, I should say, and she ra ran a 352-acre farm on her own. Her husband died, and uh, rather than sell the farm and the hotel and tavern, she managed both and did it very well. So as I said, it was an underground railroad stop during the era when slaves were fl fleeing Pennsylvania to go to Canada. She housed them for the night, hid them for the night, I should say. So very proud of her also. So you have a lot of treason in your background. <laughs> a, lot <of> <laughs> <laughs> a lot of treason in my family, that's for sure, Frank. Okay, what about I want to jump for just a second to the Civil War. Okay. Because you have family there too. Yes, I do. And uh, my father was, uh, my grandfather was a late in life baby, uh, born in 1861. And his two brothers, about 16 and 17 years older than my grandfather, had just enlisted in the uh, Union Army. And they were, they'd gone off to war. And at this, around the same time, uh, 1861, Lincoln's best friend, a Lieutenant Ellsworth in the Union Army, and truly was Lincoln's best friend, young man, was trying to flush out a Confederate, confederate from a house in Alexandria, Virginia, which still hung the confederate, confederate flag out of the window. And as he entered the house, he was shot, to de shot dead. And that was 
in every newspaper in America for days on end. And as I said, his last name was Ellsworth. My middle name is Ellsworth. Mm -hmm. And a historian at Independence National Historical Park said, I told him, no record of Ellsworth's at all in the family. And when he kn knew the story, he said, it's quite simple. Your gra grandfather read those papers every day, and <laughs> he simply named you, your middle name, Ellsworth. After, after <laughs> Lieutenant Ellsworth of the Union Army, Lincoln's best friend. So I'm proud of that, Frank. So you've been carrying that around all these years? Didn't know it. <laughs> and didn't know Nobody it? Nobody in the family knew. And I talked to this ranger mm -hmm. at Independence Hall, was an historian. He said the answer is quite simple. Your grandfather was a, quite a patriot, two sons in the Army. Mm -hmm. Lieutenant Ellsworth gets shot. It's in the paper every day. You, you were born. He named your middle name Ellsworth. What else could it be? That's right. What else could it be? Nothing. Okay. So let's go back to Independence Hall. Right. And Jack has some information about the revolution, which we're finding out. You're very knowledgeable. And tell us a little bit about those experiences for how many years? About 20. You've been doing? Been a, uh, commuting from California to Philadelphia. Commuting. To volunteer. I say commuting because I go back for maybe two weeks at a time, sometimes three weeks at a time, go back, to, come home to California, go back again, volunteer at Independence you're, Hall. You're still doing this? Are you still Except doing it? Except for the physical problem I have right, right. now, and my hip and so forth, I'll be doing it again, yes. In, mm -hmm. in fact, I'll be doing it October the 30th, I think, which is my birthday. I'm going to row in a three-mile event on the Schuylkill River All right. in a boat that will average 80... 80, I think 80 or 84 years of age. Not bad. I'll be in Not that boat. Bad. Yeah, so Not bad. Not <laughs> bad. Anyway, uh, I go would go back there quite frequently to do two things: um, row on the Schuylkill River with my old cronies. One old day, young, cro young cronies. Young cronies. The <laughs> next day, you'd find me at Independence Hall, uh, taking people on tours into the r most important room, historically speaking. In America, it's called the Assembly Room. It's inside of the most important building in America, now known as Independence Hall. In those days, it was known as the Pennsylvania State House. It was the headquarters for Ben Franklin's government in the state of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. It got the name Independence Hall quite by default. Uh, a man who was Washington's uh, Comrade in arms during the Revolutionary War, a Frenchman uh, who served valiantly with Washington, uh, came back to visit Philadelphia after the, about 50 years after the Revolutionary War was over. And uh, when he got to Philadelphia, uh, he asked to see La Hall Independence. And his Philadelphia host didn't have the foggiest <laughs> idea of what he was talking about. The Philadelphians are pretty sharp people. They realized a heartbeat later or so that uh, he, he was talking about the Pennsylvania State House. So they took him there. And when he got there, he entered the assembly room where the Declaration of Independence was signed, the U.S. Constitution was signed, and the Articles of Confederation were signed. And he put out both arms. <laughs> and he said, between these sacred walls was formed the United States of America. So that, 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 that and, and the Philadelphians love that name, uh, Independence Hall. He called it La Hall Independence. They seized it. Yeah, and they amplified it over the years to where today the name Independence Hall is an icon of, uh, and its image is an icon of freedom and self-government, not only for Americans, but for people around the world. So that's a kind of an interesting, interesting story as to how we, how we got its name. Tell us about some of your other stories uh, at Independence Hall, because you give these tours, and how long are the tours? The tours last. Uh, a half an hour. Half an hour? Yeah, you, you give them a, 
a 15 minute orientation first in an orientation room, which is the east wing of Independence Hall. Independence Hall has two appendages, appendages the east wing and the west wing. And so uh, the ori orientation is on the first floor of the east wing. So we spend 15 minutes with them, with the visitors, kind of warming them up a little bit. Uh, Would that be helpful to our viewers to go a little through? Maybe because uh, they're sitting, many of them probably do not know it, but they're sitting in the most historic city block in America and sitting in a building about to visit a building, which is the most important building historically So give speaking. us a little flavor how you, how you build this up. Okay, well, when they first get there, I, I greet them. There might be 80 or 90 of them. And I stand in front of them, I welcome them to Philadelphia, and I say, uh, folks, you're sitting in the most important city block in America. The events that occurred in this block shaped the foundation of the United States of America. In a few minutes, we'll visit a building that saw many of those events unfold. You were looking at it when you're standing in line waiting to come into this building. It used to be called the Pennsylvania State House, headquarters for Ben Franklin and his government of the state of Pennsylvania. Now, of course, called Independence Hall. But it got that, did I mention how? Uh, yes. Yeah, okay. mm -hmm. yeah. it, it was man by the Lafayette, by the name of Lafayette, really gave it its name when he called it La Hall Independence. General, Philadelphia. General, General Lafayette. General Lafayette, <laughs> Washington's comrade in arms, right. And he, uh, he loved uh, Philadelphia, he loved America, and he was indispensable, really, to, to Washington, a great, great general, great human being. So he really is the one who gave it its name by, by default, so to speak. So it's an interesting building, and uh, in it, of course, is the most important room in American history. It's called the Assembly Room. Most important to, because in that room, America was born. The Declaration of Independence, the Articles of Confederation, and the United States Constitution were all conceived, debated, and signed in that room. So there's no question about the fact when you stand in that room, you are standing in the birthplace of America. An interesting, interesting uh, tour to lead. Get many interesting people on that tour uh, from, from around the world. They come from, you name the country, and they have been there on, a, on an Independence Hall tour. So you'd yeah. recommend that? Absolutely recommend it, yes. Um, Today, it's under heavy security, as you might suspect. Okay. But and oh, the lady who, <laughs> yes. Sorry. The super, I, go ahead. I just wanted you, there's a story that you have about a, a young Marine that came in. That oh, that was uh, at that the was Liberty Bell Pavilion. Yes, at the Liberty I'll Bell. I'll tell you that in just a okay. moment. But uh, Independence <laughs> Hall is the most important building in America, historically speaking. And the, the, uh, the assembly room is the most important room in America, and when one stands in it, you're standing literally in the birthplace of America. Every time I walk into that room, without exception, even as many times as I have done it, my pulse elevates somewhat because I'm walking among the tables and chairs that, that were sat in and at by our founding fathers, Ben Franklin, John Adams, I can point out the tables. These aren't they, reproductions. Where they sat. These Pardon? aren't reproductions. No. No, they're original. And uh, all those chairs were in that building. May not have been in that room at the, at the but they're in that building at that time. And uh, it's just, and there's a wooden railing. It's called the bar. And it was there during revolutionary times. And it separated the legislature Pennsylvania legislature, which occupied that, that room, from the visitors. Visitors could walk in off the street, stand behind that, that bar, that railing, a, and observe the proceedings of the Pennsylvania legislature. This, the Pennsylvania legislature loaned that building, that room, to our Second Continental Congress 
when the shot fired heard around the world was fired up in Massachusetts, and they just concluded a meeting in Philadelphia in Carpenter's Hall as the first Continental Congress. The shot was fired. Rather than go home, they went, went to the Pennsylvania State House to decide what to do about that shot. As I said, loaned to them by the Pennsylvania legislature. So they debated for just about a year. They, didn't, they weren't hasty in their decision <laughs> at all about what to do about that shot. Because look, those gentlemen, after all, were loyal British subjects residing mm -hmm. in, in Philadelphia. And they were loyal to the crown. And they, they weren't going to willy-nilly uh, pull off an act of revolution. To be, a to be a traitor. Debating it. Treason. Sure. treason. Yeah. yeah, it would be treason moreover, right? Yeah. But they, they debated this for, for almost a year, just about a year, uh, when a delegate from Virginia sitting at the Virginia table, and I always po point out to the visitors where they sat, he's, Richard Henry Lee sat at the Virginia table. Richard Henry Lee, after one year, had enough of this petty bickering. And so he stood up and he said, resolved that these colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states. What a treasonous statement <laughs> to make, folks. Sure. I heard by the British Army, I guarantee you, he'd be swinging f from the closest sycamore tree. But he made it nevertheless. And what amazes me, after, after making most, one of the most dramatic resolutions in history, because we took a, a turn at that point in history, after Henry, Richard Henry Lee made that statement, he simply walked home that evening <laughs> from his home, from his Independence Hall to his home on 4th Street, just, just a couple of blocks away, like, like nothing happened. And no drone got him. No, it's amazing. <laughs> As I said, heard by the British Army, he would have been, been hung immediately, no question about it. A lot of courage. A lot, lot of courage. A lot of courage. And our founding fathers didn't take that statement lightly, uh, just like today, I think, in our Congress, when they don't, don't know what the next step really is, what do they do? But go back to them. Go back to them. Not, not today's Congress. Go back to... Okay, go back. They didn't really know what to do, so the next logical step was to form a committee <laughs> to, <Not> study, <laughs> to study Richard Henry Lee's resolution, <laughs> right? So they, they went about a block away, two blocks actually. It, they went from 5th Street to 7th Street to a house owned by a German bricklayer by the name of Graf. It was called the Graft House, now called the Graft House. And they met on the second floor of that building, Thomas Jefferson and the committee, to decide what to do about the shot heard around the world. And Jefferson, well, first of all, they gave a quill tip pen to John Adams to do the writing. And Adams said, no. He said, uh, he pointed at Jefferson. He said, you write 10 times better than I do. <laughs> And so forth. So he begged off the hook on that su subject, gave the quill tip pen to Jefferson. So Jefferson did the writing in that meeting. And s a week or so later, they came back into, into Independence Hall with a document that was all marked up, scribbled, words crossed out, and so forth. The Declaration of Independence. Hmm. And they presented that to the Second Continental Congress who again didn't jump up and down and clap and say, good job, <laughs> Mr. Jefferson, let's get on with it. They wanted to debate it, naturally, and so they did. And then they resolved to, uh, to uh, break the tie, the bond with uh, Great Britain. The first time they put that resolution up that we should be free in independent states, it won by a margin of 10 to 2. Uh, two states dissented, Pennsylvania and South Carolina. And the re that was good enough to pass, mm -hmm. but not good enough for a man by the name of Rutledge from South Carolina. He sprung to his feet, and he pointed to uh, the chairman, and he said, resolved that we adjourn for the day, reconvene in the morning, 
and take a second vote. I believe my state, South Carolina, will change her vote overnight. <laughs> and you know what? That passed. They went home for the evening. Came in the next morning. They had news from the front from Washington. They covered that first. And about mid-morning, they got on the subject of <laughs> the resolution breaking away from Great Britain. And they argued all day long. Uh, Franklin got to his feet, and he spoke for, I believe, it was a little over three hours <laughs> on, on uh, separating from the mother uh -huh. country. It was getting late in the afternoon. A violent thunderstorm was sweeping through Philadelphia. Lightning flashing, rain splashing against those windows. They had, a, they had to light candles. They lit the candles, and they took a vote, the second vote, on July the 2nd. 1776 mm. and this time the vote was 12 to 0 in favor of separation from the mother country. England or uh, rather the New Yorkers didn't have have word from New York as to, to w which way they should vote so they abstain. So so 12 to 0 and one abstention it passed unanimously so to speak and uh, we did break away from mm. the mother country on July the 2nd. Most Amer Americans think it was July the 4th. It was not. It was clearly July the 2nd saw the end of the British rule over these 13 colonies. This is a good history lesson. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Tony wants you to tell the story of the uh, Marine. Oh, uh, they move us around and if you volunteer for the, let's say, four or eight hours there, they give you a little uh, piece of paper with your schedule on it for the day. Mm -hmm. At 10 o'clock, Jack, you will be in Independence Hall leading a tour group. At 11 o'clock, you'll be at the Liberty Bell Pavilion, right? So Liberty Bell Pavilion has three posts. And we start out at the lower post, move to the second, then move up the, in the Liberty Bell chamber itself and, uh, and stand there. You have a story about the Liberty Bell, too. Yes, I do. But tell, tell that first story. Uh, <laughs> I think my most memorable story about the Liberty Bell is I was in there one day. It was a cold February day, dark outside already at, uh, at a few minutes to five, and a Marine came in in full uniform. And uh, he said to me, uh, can I take a picture of the bell? I said, sure. Took a picture of the bell, and he said, can I touch it? And that was a no-no. They used to let people touch the Liberty Bell. And at the bottom of the bell, we have oil in our fingers. Mm -hmm. uh, after a relatively short period of time, mm -hmm. the bottom of the Liberty Bell is all discolored and black. So they said, no more touching of the Liberty Bell. They cordoned it off. And he said, I'd like to touch it. And I said, undid the, the, the rope there and let him in. He touched the Liberty Bell and turned around, and he had tears in his eyes. It chokes me mm -hmm. up today to even think about it. A tears in his, take my picture in front of the bell. I said, sure. So I took his picture, and uh, he said, I can't wait to get back to my unit to show them this picture of he standing by himself, standing by the mm -hmm. Liberty Bell. And I closed the, the gate again. So did something wrong, but if caught, maybe I'd get fired for non-paying job. Treason? Is this treason? <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> Another treason is that. <laughs> <laughs> Let the Marine touch the bell. <laughs> but he was so happy with that. Which war was, it was, which war was he? It was the Iraq War. Iraq, okay. In Iraq. Okay. He was on, on, his way, on his way back to Iraq Rock for his second tour of duty. Okay. okay. So, so I had empathy mm -hmm. for that man. Okay. Good story. Liberty Bell's also a good story. Okay. You mean getting the bell, the... Normandy Liberty Bell here? Yeah. Well, even before that, in terms of how it, the Frenchmen that were. Oh, yeah. The, uh, is it the Liberty Bell close to, again, close to closing one day, when a couple of well-dressed gentlemen in navy blue suits came in, and there were still a couple kids milling around in the Liberty Bell chamber, and one of them said to me with an accent that I thought was French, Sir, can you pose with the children in front of the bell? I said, sure. So I squatted down. The kids were next to me, and they took the picture. And when I stood up, they said, your picture will be all over France. 
<laughs> in glossy brochures. And I said, why? And they said, we just got permission from Independence Hall National Park to cast a duplicate, a replica, an exact replica of this bell. We did it last night. We didn't even have to touch it. They had, <coughs> had an American firm who specialized in taking, taking photographs, I call them photographs, mm -hmm. but they set sensors around the bell and they took, took these pictures at, at night without even touching the bell. And I saw the, some of the prints later on of those things. Magnificent. And I said, what are you going to do with it? And they, they said, well, we're going to uh, seek permission to place the bell that we cast in the American Cemetery at Point du Hoc. Mm -hmm. And that really touched my soul because I had a very close friend who was a rowing buddy, and a really close friend, two of them in fact, one was an oarsman, uh, and it rowed in a, a crew called the Golden Eight that I rowed in for many, many years. And Sid Salomon was a member of that Golden Eight. And Sid was one of the first people on the beach on D-Day. He scaled those cliffs <laughs> to knock out the German uh, guns up there so they couldn't rain fire down on, on the invasion forces. And what a guy. When you look at him, when you look at him in those days, he looked like an FBI agent or insurance salesman <laughs> or something like that with his <laughs> navy blue suit and his white shirt and striped tie. And the, the perfect gentleman type. You'd never think that he would have been a ranger in World War II because they were rugged individuals. Mm -hmm. And, and the government, the Army, asked them to do things that they, they wouldn't ask the regular troops to do, you know, like scale those cliffs, for example. Sid told me an interesting story that uh, he told his troops, he was a, a first lieutenant at the time, and their landing barge was on a ship, a British ship called the Prince Charles. So when they were awakened about 2 o'clock in the morning by a, a message over the square, Squawk box, uh, Second Ranger Battalion, man your landing craft. Uh, they went into their, got into the landing craft on board the Prince Charles. And Sid told me he reminded them for the umpteenth time that when they were dropped in the water and a, raft, a ramp went down, if somebody got hit by enemy fire, you don't try to help them and drag them ashore. And he mentioned that, that numerous times to them. So when the time came to drop their landing craft into the water and the ramp dropped down, Sid and a sergeant next to him were the first ones into the waist-deep water, and the sergeant was hit by gunfire. Mm -hmm. Guess who dragged him up <laughs> on the beach? Sid <laughs> Solomon. <laughs> he couldn't <laughs> resist. He dragged his butt up, and then he got hit. Mm -hmm. But uh, even though he was wounded, he got to the base of the cliff and got his way to the top, and they knocked out those German... German artillery guns up there, and the landing, uh, the, the invasion forces were, were saved from German fire from on high there. Interesting to note th that the weather was absolutely terrible that day. Dark clouds, windy, and Rommel and th had been that way for many days and forecasted to continue that way. So Rommel, the German general at Point du Hoc, went home to celebrate his wife's Third, birthday. Yeah. <laughs> and no fool would invade, invade in this weather, right? Mm -hmm. Wrong. <laughs> the American 2nd <laughs> Ranger Battalion did just that. Okay, we're going to get to the Liberty Bill, but before that, so this program is about mental toughness. And so there's a story about Jack as a young kid and George Noble, the bully. Oh, the bully, yeah. All right, tell us about what happened and, and your father's involvement with you. And Yeah, I, I live within walking distance from the Liberty Bell. I could walk down. I was last house on a, in a row, in a, in a house, red brick row houses in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And I'd walk out of my house, turn left, walk a block, cross a bridge. I'm in Fairmount Park, walk through Fairmount Park down to the... Uh, uh, Independence Hall. And I used to walk down there many times just to sit and admire it. it really sounds corny, but that was true. Well, one day, uh, day I was outside playing and I came home with a bloody nose. We had a 
a bully in the neighborhood by the name of George. And uh, I came home probably one too many times with a bloody nose. <laughs> And it angered, ang really angered my father. He grabbed me by the scruff of the neck and <laughs> took me up the street. Where does he live? And I said, right there. Well, George came out of the house, and my father kind of pushed me towards George, right? <laughs> and this time, <laughs> with blood over my shirt, I, I, I bloodied George's nose, and I, I won that fight. And that was the last time that George picked on me. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> and then there's also a story before you graduated from uh, high school, this is around World War II. Yeah, before World you, War II. You're like, what, 16, 17, before you graduated? I was 17. My, I wanted to join the Marines when I was 17. And I guess my parents had more sense than me. <laughs> People are getting killed now in the Pacific, and I want to join the Marines. So the, they said no, they wouldn't sign for me. Mm -hmm. So I got a little ticked off at my parents. I quit high school, dropped out. Going to show them. And I took a job at the Philadelphia Navy Yard, and I worked on the USS Wisconsin. But before you to talk about talk about lunchtime, lunchtime. Oh, I was going to say at lunch. While I was a, a, an apprentice ship fitters, apprentice ship fitter on board the USS Wisconsin, uh, at lunchtime they entertained the workers with prize fights, boxing matches. They'd set up a ring right by <coughs> the ship way there. Mm -hmm. And these uh, guys that I work with, they egged me on, hey, kid, you'd be a pretty good boxer, <laughs> blah, blah. And so finally, they embarrassed me to say, I said, yes, OK, I enter it. So they entered me in, in the boxing matches at lunchtime. And the first time I, I was in the fight in the, in the ring, and these ship fitters are sitting up on the rafters and the, uh, on the Wisconsin eating their, eating their lunch watching the fight, and I, I uh, kicked this kid all around the ring that I fought. I won he was my weight and everything, mm -hmm. and I won the fight. I got back uh, after lunch, and these guys are patting me on the back and everything and egging me on to the next <laughs> fight. <laughs> well, the next uh, fight, I was supposed to fight a young man who was my, my, uh, my weight, mm -hmm. and he didn't come to work that day for, for whatever <laughs> reason. And they put another uh, a ringer in for him, who was a heavyweight. And the, the <laughs> man who was coordinating these fights said, hey, kid, he's going <coughs> to just box with you for three, three rounds. OK, he's heavier than you, yeah, but he won't hurt you. He beat me around that <laughs> ring for th <laughs> three <laughs> rounds. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> so that was the end of my fighting. Okay, <laughs> But that, it's neat to recollect in these days that the Wisconsin is now tied up here in the Los Angeles area. And I worked on that ship in 1943 huh. as a, an apprentice ship fitter. Okay, so you're, you're not in high school. So then you turn 18. So I turned 18, I went down, and I enlisted. And in those, in the, at that point in time, uh, they, were, they had too many people wanted to go in the Navy, so to speak. And so they were prorating the services, you know, allocating. You get these many people. So they tr tried to put me in the Air Force. I don't know what reason. I didn't want to go in the Air Force. I said, no, I don't think I'd like that. So the man compromised with me. He said, how about the field artillery? <laughs> I said, OK. So they put That's me better. in the field artillery, right? <laughs> but you know, I think back on those days, had I said yes to the Air Force, not being a high school graduate, I'd have been a waste gunner, a tail gunner on board one of those bombers over Europe. No question in my mind, as I look back on it, I might not be here today. Mm -hmm. So just a stroke of luck, I said. There oh. you go. So they put me in a field artillery. Okay, and then tell us, we'll talk a little bit about rowing, how you got involved in rowing. Oh, yeah. Because me, you've been rowing for your life. Um, most of my life, okay. exactly. So tell us about how that started. When I was discharged from the Army in 1946, uh, the 1946 Major League Baseball season was just starting up. It was April, and uh, I, I was always a Phillies so I'm going to go out and see the Phillies tonight. Right? So I went to a Phillies game, and uh, the usher who showed me my seat and took that cloth and dusted it off was right by the... Uh, the, the, the walkway there, the uh, steps, uh, was a very attractive young lady. I mean, very attractive. And so she, uh, she spent 
after she had everybody seated, she would always come back to where I was seated, sitting, have a conversation with me. And her name was Rita Lyons, and mm -hmm. she said to How me. How many years ago was this? This is like. That was 1946. 46, okay. And Do I the math. Her vividly. <laughs> and I don't know how we got on the subject. I told her where I lived, and she said, Well, you're near Boathouse Row. Have you? Have you ever rowed or belonged to a boat club? I said, no. Would you like to? I said, sure. So she <laughs> said, well, my brothers belong to the Penn Athletic Club. Meet me there on Wednesday night, w Wednesday afternoon at 6 o'clock. That's when they row. I'll introduce to my brothers. Uh, the la We used to <laughs> didn't call her to tell her this later on. They rode a pair word show, by the way. Two people, nor in each hand. Okay. Very difficult boat to row, as you might imagine. It's only about a foot or so wide. And one oar goes out to port, and the other goes out to starboard. So it's a very unstable boat from a, a standpoint of setting it up as we so you don't flip over and make it go straight. Anyway, she interviews <coughs> her brother, John Lyons, and he got me a membership in the Penn Athletic Club. And that was, in, as I said, in April 1947, and I've been rowing ever since then. Hmm. You know, I rowed in eight oar crews in, in, uh, at the Penn Athletic Club and became uh, the captain of the club after a couple of years. It's interesting because uh, everybody in the club was Catholic. <laughs> I was the only Protestant in the club, and they made me the captain <laughs> 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 of the club. Mm. But uh, I got to know those fellows very well, as you might suspect. And we had a, a, a hard-nosed coach by the name of Tom Curran, who was an Olympian from the 1936 Olympics. He, he rode that one of those pyroid shells that I just mentioned mm. in front of Adolf Hitler. So uh, qu quite, a, quite a Norseman and, and quite a tough coach. He put together a crew, mostly of some high school graduates, recent high school graduates, oarsmen, but most of us were World War II veterans. And, and the one, one of Jim Wright flew P-51s over Europe. He was in that crew. And Tom Kern coached us, and boy, what a taskmaster he was. Go up to the river, three miles, turn around, be coming back down again, and he'd be with that big megaphone right on the rudder of the eight-oared shell, yelling at us at the top of his lungs. You what would he like, say? What would he say? Drive those legs down. <laughs> Drive those legs down. Come on. <laughs> come on, Jack. Come on, Bill. Come on, Jim. You know, you like that. You feel like, you know, I, I quit. <laughs> no, my guts are coming out. Right? But he, he got us in shape, no question about that. We went out to Detroit to row in the, in the club national rowing championships on the Detroit River. And uh, most of the crews were older than us, also World, World War II veterans, people like West Side Rowing Club in, in Buffalo, all World War II veterans. And uh, on the starting line, there were six eight-oar crews in the final event. We won our heat in the trials, and came through the repechage, got in the final, and we al almost, <laughs> not quite, beat West Side Rowing Club for the n national championships. We came in second, but it was a tough row. But we were pleased with that because if it hadn't been for Tom Curran, uh, we wouldn't have been there. He had had a fight and argue with the, the club management to send us there, to get us there in the first place. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to send us. We're too new, you know, blah, blah, blah. But we got there and we almost got a national championship medal. What, wasn't there a story about you, uh, all World War II vets, rowing against all World War II vets? Yeah, that the was German in, in one of my, uh, we, we, won't, we learned that the World Masters Rowing Championships, an event called FISA, F-I-S-A, Federation Internationale Society de Aveyron, French organization, controlled this thing. And uh, for the first time ever, they had it in North America. And we learned about it. Say, hey, let's put together a crew and go up and enter that. It had to be a, the crew had to average 60 years of age. That was <laughs> the oldest bracket. What year would that have been? That was 1986. Okay. And so we put together this crew of oarsmen mm -hmm. from the 10 rowing clubs. You could have been in that group. In Philadelphia. <laughs> yeah, I so wasn't old enough. 
Now, now, <laughs> now. <laughs> we went up to uh, to Canada mm. to uh, to row in that. <clears throat> I guess we surprised ourselves as we got a gold medal. And that really whet our appetite. 1986. Came back to Philadelphia, and we wonder where it's going to be in 1987. 1987 was, can't, I think it was in, in, in Italy. And in 1987, as you might, have, might recall, it was a year characterized by terrorism, hijacking airliners. Mm -hmm. There was a TWA that was hijacked on the tarmac in Rome. So a couple of, of the men in our crew got cold feet and they said, no, you'd have to be crazy to fly to Europe and there's terrorism going on. So we skipped 1987. 1988, it was in, it was in uh, uh, Norway. So we decided to, to go and row in, in, in Norway on a beautiful lake. And uh, was it Norway, Joe? No, it was, uh, no, was Strathclyde. Strathclyde, Scotland? Yeah, it was Scotland. That's, okay. that's, that was the race in Scotland. Yeah, we went to, we went to Scotland in, in 1987. 1988, and uh, during that regatta, we came head to head with a with a German crew, and uh, cut the story short, we beat them. And uh, as we came back into the, it, we went to the dock to get our medal. We came back in, and we put our shell on the rack, and went down to pick up our roars. And the Germans were com coming in and putting their boat away and picking up their oars, they came over and they hugged us and we shook hands and so forth. And one of them said to us uh, in broken English, you will be in uh, Vichy next year? And a crewmate of mine who rode right behind me in the bow seat, Gus Constant said, yeah, yeah. And he said, good, good. Literally translated, folks, that meant we'll get you guys next year, right? <laughs> <laughs> no mistaking that, that's what that meant. So the next year we were in, sh in uh, where was it? Where did I, it Italy. It, we're in Northern, Northern Italy, I guess, yeah. yeah anyway. Anyway, uh, we got back there and uh, we had, I guess, the toughest race of our life in that eight oared shell. And uh, we we're known as the Golden Eight in those days. A, a Philadelphia paper gave us that name after we won the third international gold medal, they called us the Golden Eight. So we liked that name, we kept it. <laughs> and <coughs> over the years, in later years, the name more applied to how old we were rather than just how many gold medals we won, I guess. But anyway, uh, we met this German crew again, and we had the toughest race that we've ever had. It was like bow ball to bow ball, so to speak, all the way down the course. And at the finish line, the buzzer, the finish people went beep, beep. And we didn't know whether <laughs> the first beep was for them or for us, because you can't tell sitting in the boat. Mm -hmm. And we sat there for, it seemed like eternity, probably 30 seconds or so. And I looked at the videotape, the judges, and said, Etas Unis to the awards doc. That was us, of course. And we got a gold medal. Mm -hmm. Great. So that was uh, <coughs> probably the, the greatest race I've had as a master oarsman. Now, unfortunately, we only have an hour show. <laughs> Otherwise, we'd be going on and on, because there's so many stories, Jack, that we didn't tell, you didn't, didn't tell, them. and some of them are in the book, some are not in the book. You'd have to Google Jack Scholl, and maybe you'd find out more information. But Jack has been such a delightful guest and a perfect example of mental toughness. It goes back to years and years, you know? Yeah, I think, uh, Frank, there's hardly a, a crew race that Norseman is in. Rowing a, a, is synonymous with pain to begin with, all right? <laughs> it really is. You know it's going to hurt. Anyway, I know almost every race I've ever rowed in, you know, near the finish line when you think your stomach's coming unglued, and every, every muscle on the body is screaming for, for you want to stop rowing and you keep going one more stroke and uh, you say to yourself many 
I'm through with this sport. I'm not going <laughs> to ever row again. And you believe it at the time. But <laughs> after <coughs> the race is over, whether you win or lose, hopefully win, you go back to the boathouse, shower down, and so forth, and you forget about the pain. And you're back out again <laughs> the next day. Yeah, we practice, know the feeling. Right? <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that. Well, you folks that, know that yeah. better that than anybody. That fits yeah. the bill. Sure. So. <laughs> I thank you for coming, Jack. It's been uh, just a real, real pleasure. And hopefully uh, other people, our viewers, will enjoy. And thank you for the history lesson. Well, it's been so. like a long time since I've been taught American history. <laughs> Very long time. Well, Frank, I don't <laughs> say this capriciously. I, I'm deeply honored to be here on your program. I really am. Thank you for inviting me. You're welcome. Thank you. Our You're pleasure. Welcome. And you're going to get a tape of oh, a DVD.